So how was it? Did you all have a good celebration? I want to thank you for one of the best Advents and Christmases that I've ever experienced. It was such a powerful, powerful season for me. And I learned a lot of things. Like, I learned that it's not only my wife, Yvette, who loves the movie Love Actually, that many of you consider it a regular part of your Christmas preparation as well. Came out in the wake of 2001 when 9 11 occurred. And the movie was, in part, a bold declaration that, as messed up as our world can be, that good things still happen. And that even in the midst of all the chaos, love is always all around us. But really, I can't say it anywhere near as well as Hugh Grant can during the opening credits, so let's go ahead and play those. Whenever I get gloomy with the state of the world, I think about the arrivals gate at Heathrow Airport. General opinion is starting to make out that we live in a world of hatred and greed, but I don't see that seems to me that love is everywhere. Often it's not particularly dignified or newsworthy, but it's always there. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, old friends. When the planes hit the Twin Towers, as far as I know, none of the phone calls from the people on board were messages of hate or revenge. They were all messages of love. If you look for it, I've got a sneaky feeling you'll find that love actually is all around. Good movie, isn't it? Now, I understand that I don't think many people would say that 2019 has been as bad as 2001, but I know that for a lot of people, it's been a very tough year. Things going on in our nation, around our world, things going on in your lives. Evacuations, health crises. Loss of jobs, loss of loved ones. And the longer I'm here, the more I viscerally feel all of it. I feel your heartache in my throat. On Christmas Eve, one of our young members came up and just gave me a bear hug and said, I just can't wait for 2019 to be over. And I get it. Not just in your lives, but in our nation and around our world with the rise of white supremacy and mass shootings and hate crimes just this weekend, all this anti-Semitic crime going on in New York. The fires that burned on our hillsides and burned down Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. As we fought over impeachments and Brexits and Syrian pullouts and Turkish invasions and children being snatched from their families at the border of our own country. It's been a tough year in a lot of ways. But I'm here to declare to you this morning that good things are happening as well. That right in the middle of all of this heartache and confusion and animosity and vitriol, the deterioration of public discourse, that good things continue to happen. And for us as people of faith, if we're willing to take the long view over the arc of human history, we can see that step by step progress is being made. It may be two, three steps forward and two steps backward, but one small step at a time, the world is becoming a better place. And what's more, God and the scriptures have said that it's always going to be like this. That this is the way it is going to be, that the good and the bad are going to grow side by side. In fact, Jesus told it, us it was going to be like this. In one of his parables from Matthew 13, Jesus talks about a landowner, a farmer, who goes out and sows good seed in his soil. I want you to listen carefully to Jesus' parable 
Listen carefully for the word of God. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Do you see it? Do you see it, the, the good and the bad growing up together? We have this man who sows good seed, but then when they start to grow, they see that there's, wheat, there's, there's weeds and tares among, among the good wheat. And he doesn't say it's like one is getting bigger while the other one's getting smaller or choking the other out. No, he says that they're growing up together at the same time, side by side, intertwined with each other. And the servants come to him and say, should we try to untangle it all? Should we try to pull the weeds out from amongst the wheat? And it's so interesting what the owner says. He says, no. No, let them grow together. Just let them be. At the end of time, when we, we will cut it all down, and then it will be really easy to separate out which is wheat and which is weeds. We'll throw the weeds into the fire, and the wheat will be collected into my barn. This is a beautiful image that, that, yes, it is a chaotic, even some would say evil time in our world right now. There's so much fear and insecurity. There's so much animosity and polarization going on. But at the exact same time, good things are happening as well. Those who believe in God, those who want to carry this child into the world, to become a manger, to allow this child into the world. They are doing good things in our world, and it is making a real difference. This whole month, we've been talking about what it would look like for us to become the mangers, that the Christ child could be born once again into our lives and into our world, to bring God's hope and love, to bring God's justice and peace and mercy And I am here to tell you this morning, as we prepare to exit 2019 and to enter into 2020, that it is happening. That good things are happening in the midst of all of the scariness and all of the confusion. That it's been that way ever since this child was born in that manger, in that forgotten little village from a forgotten little, well, <laughs> no longer forgotten, um, peasant, unwed peasant teenage mom. Something was released into our world that day. A love. It changed everything in the course of human history. And that wherever his followers are willing to become the vessel, to become the manger, to allow God's love to be incarnated into their time and their culture and their situations, that everything changes. It's been happening from that first day, not long after that child was born. His followers who watched him grow up, who listened to his teachings, they remembered when he said, whatever you do to the least of these, you have done to me. And it changed the way that the world understood about compassion and caring for others. 
the first hospital ever created was in the wake of the plagues in Rome and this child's followers who remembered that he had said, if you love me, you will lay down your lives for others. So while people around Rome, people were throwing their own family members who weren't yet dead out into the gutter because they didn't want to catch the plague. This small band of Christians were coming around at night and collecting the people off the streets and bringing them into their own homes to try to cure them or to give them a dignified place to die. The first official hospital was opened by St. Benedict, and by the 6th century, all of the monasteries had a hospital as part of their ministry. It was these same people who decided that they wanted to be the modern-day Theotokuses, the, the God-bearers, the ones who would carry God's presence, carry Christ's love into this world through their own bodies. They are the ones who began the hospice movement. They had heard their rabbi talk about children in a whole new way. One time when the disciples had been trying to shoo the children away from Jesus, Jesus said, no, let them come to me. For to such as these belong the kingdom of God. And it changed the way the world treated children from that time forward. The followers of this child opened the first orphanages. They championed the first child labor laws and protection laws. They heard what their, their rabbi had said about freedom, and they, they championed the abolition of slavery. Ever since the time of Exodus, people knew that God's first and foremost commandment was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul. But when this child came along, when this, this Jesus came into our world, a whole new kind of love and understanding exploded onto the scene. They remember that when they asked him what the most important commandment was, he quoted the same thing from Exodus, but he added one small phrase. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your, mind, all of your soul, and all of your mind. And suddenly, the importance of knowledge and truth and education shot to the forefront. It was the beginning of the understanding of, of public education and universal literacy. The first printing presses, it all kind of around the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther started talking about how every believer was their own priest. And so it became very important that everyone be able to read and interpret the scriptures. It was one of the big reasons the printing press was created, was so that they could publish the Bible in different countries and native tongues. The first university was opened in Paris in the 12th century in honor of this child to try to become an incubator, a vessel, a manger where this child's love and hope and mercy and justice could spring forth into a new world and a new time. It was followed by Cambridge and Oxford and Naples and Vienna and Rome, each opening universities dedicated to the memory of this child. All of the universities in the United States before the Revolutionary War, except for one, were universities that were opened in honor of this child. Harvard, Yale, William and Mary, Princeton, which happened to be the Presbyterian College of New Jersey. Most of the greatest architecture and music and paintings and literature Built, written, composed, painted, sculpted in honor of this child who told us to love one another, to care for each other. Leo Tolstoy, the devout Christian, dedicated his book War and Peace to Jesus Christ. He wrote another book called Resurrection. It was banned in Russia but a young South African lawyer who had been trained in Britain got a hold of it and loved it so much, loved the way it talked about Jesus loving his enemies, that he started a Tolstoy community in South Africa. 
The last letter that Leo Tolstoy wrote in his life was to this young South African lawyer, a man by the name of Mahatma Gandhi. And he inspired a man in the United States by the name of Martin Luther King Jr., who loved Gandhi's Jesus-like way of dealing with your enemies, who inspired a man down in South Africa once again named Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who finally convinced another man named Nelson Mandela to go this way of peace. And it just goes on and on and on. And don't think that this is all just about ancient history. Listen to some of these statistics. Since 1980, the last 40 years alone, in 1980, 78% of this world was suffering from malnutrition. Today, that number is 17%. In 1980, 60% of the world was in substandard housing. Today, it's 20%. In 1980, just 40 years ago, 71% of the world was on the verge, or sorry, wait a second, 60% of the world was on the verge of starvation. Today, that's down to 13%. Like one fourth, one fifth in just 40 years. And in 1980, 71% of the world was illiterate. Today, that is down to an amazing 14%. Good things are happening. God's love is all around, and it is being made manifest. It is doing good things in our lives and in our world through people who are committed to allowing their lives to be the manger that God's love shows up in our time and our culture through. Even 2019, as tough as it is, as tough as it has been, with all of the things that have been going on. Some really good things have been happening as well. The wheat and the tares, they are growing up together, side by side, intertwined with each other. Love is actually all around us all the time as God makes small strides. I love the way that the Apostle Paul put it. In the book of Romans chapter 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirits grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. There are those who believe that world history is on the decline. I get so frustrated when I get, to group, get together with groups of pastors who talk about how the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but it's okay because, because everything, the, the world has been left to the evil one, and everything will just get worse and worse until finally Jesus comes to save the day. Others believe that the world is a giant cyclical carousel, that we just keep revisiting our mistakes and the problems of the past, and things get a little better, but then they go straight back to square one, and we just go round and round and round. And yet I am here to tell you that what the Bible says, what our faith 
demands of us is that we believe that the world is making progress, that God is creating God's kingdom here amongst us, that God has recruited us to be part of that Tikkun Elam, the, the healing of the world. And that as we make a commitment to become Christ's manger, to become the new Theotokos, to become the new God's smugglers, that we bring God's love into those places, into those places where the weeds are growing up alongside of the wheat. And so before we give up on 2019 altogether, let me close by sharing with you 25 things that happened in 2019 that I think are beautiful things that are very close to God's heart. For instance, did you know that in 2019, Malawi female chief comes to power, annuls over 1,500 child marriages, and makes it illegal and sends young girls back to school? That happened this year. This year, the Netherlands has achieved the goal of officially becoming the first country without any stray dogs. 2019, Iceland became the first country in the world to legally enforce equal pay for women and men. Not bad. 2019, sea turtles are making a huge comeback, with their populations increasing by 980%. Thanks to the Endangered Species Act. In 2019, an HIV positive man in London has become the second person ever to be cleared of the virus after stem cell transplant. And South Korea is organizing daytime disco parties for people over 65 to tackle loneliness and dementia. In 2019, Sweden has rolled out a great initiative. Blood donors get a text message whenever their blood saves a life. Oh, wait a second. In 2019, scientists in Mexico create fake plastic from cactus juice that biodegrades in a month and is safe to ingest. I'll add to that that last year, a beer company in Europe started making those rings for their beer cans out of an edible material that sea life could eat instead of get tangled in. In 2018, AIDB's solar project in Africa aims to connect 90 million people to electricity for the very first time, lifting them out of energy poverty. In 2019, Taiwan's parliament passes historic same-sex marriage law, making it the first place in Asia to do so. In 2019, German circuses use holograms instead of animals, instead of real animals, <coughs> in an attempt to end animal cruelty. In 2019, YouTube has banned white supremacist content, and thousands of hate speech channels will be removed. In 2019, a robot called Larvalbot is delivering coral babies to the Great Barrier Reef to help restore coral reefs to once, what they once were. In 2019, the ama oh, this amazing village in India celebrates their daughters by planting 111 trees every time a girl is born. So far, they have planted more than 350,000 trees. 2019, baby African elephants will no longer be taken from the wild and sold to zoos and circuses after a near total ban has been approved. In 2019, in Rome, you can now pay for metro train tickets with plastic bottles. So far, more than 350,000 bottles have been recycled. San Francisco's Cuddle Club unites senior people and senior dogs who need companionship exercise, and affection. In 2019, an Amazon tri tribe won a legal battle against oil companies preventing drilling in their part of the Amazon rainforest. In 2019, humpback whales have come back from the brink of extinction 
Thanks to conservation efforts, they've gone from a few hundred to 25,000. In Thailand, supermarkets say no to plastic packaging and wrap their produce in banana leaves. Rice farmers around the world are using ducks instead of harmful pesticides. Ducks feed on insects and weeds without touching the plants. Sounds like Jesus' parable, doesn't it? 2019, Canada passed a bill that makes it illegal to keep whales, dolphins, and porpoises in captivity for entertainment. In 2019, seven eggs from the world's last two remaining northern white rhinos have been successfully fertilized, which just may save the species. In 2019, this man in India, well, it's being reported now, but this man in India planted a tree every day for the last 35 years and created a forest larger than Central Park. And finally, in 2019, a record-breaking crowd of 4,855 people waited for hours in the rain for stem cell tests to help save a five-year-old boy fighting a rare cancer. There are some beautiful things that are happening. The wheat is growing up in the midst of the tares. Love's God is actually all around us being born once again into this world by those of us who are willing to be God's manger for our time and our place. So don't lose hope. Don't give up. God is on the move, step by step. It may be three steps forward and two steps back, but this world is bit by bit becoming a better place. In 2020, will become that much better. More amazing things than this are going to happen if you are willing to allow God's love to be born once again through you into the places you live, into your family and your community and your world. Where is it that God is calling you to be God's manger, to be God's smuggler of God's love and hope, of God's mercy? justice and peace. Amen. <coughs>